What's up, man? It's great to be with you. Everybody in Montgomeryville watching online, we're glad to have this opportunity to join you. It's been a, it's been a week, hasn't it? Like, it's just, it just feels fitting. And so, uh, but it's been, it's been a week. And so, I, uh, at the end of last week, at the end of service, I told you, hey, at the end of next week, we're going to make some really exciting announcements for our church. And I had this whole slideshow planned, and we spent time on graphics, and I was going to go over kind of what's coming, and it's still, it's still coming, but we're going to talk about raising money and all that stuff, and it just felt like this isn't the right week to do it. People's houses are getting flooded, and tornadoes are coming through, and uh, so instead of talking about raising money to, to expand, uh, which we're, we're going to do that, and, and I'll, I'll talk about it in a few weeks. For, for today, instead of focusing on that, I just felt like the Spirit of God was like, Look, just, let, don't talk about that. Let's just, let's just give money away today to help people. And so uh, what we're going to do is, so our offering cycle, if you're, not everything that comes in on Sunday is all that comes in. So people give to the church all, all week. And so they tithe, they give recurring giving, they get paid on a Monday or Tuesday or whatever. And so our offerings, we count them from Monday to Sunday. Sunday's the, the last day of the offering. Monday starts. So everything that came in, if you gave Monday through Saturday, or you give today, everything that comes in from Monday to Saturday, we're just going to give away this week. We're going to help people out. And so, uh, and I, I'll, I'll tell you this, we can only do that. We don't have to take a, a separate offering. So here, let me just say, if you want to give, give today, be a part of it. If you've already tithed and you've been looking to do more, everything you give here, right, we're going to find needs. Uh, I, the reason we can do that is because you guys are so faithful. Like the reason that we can say it's going to be fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000, we, the reason we can do that because you guys give all, all, all year faithfully. And so when stuff like this happens, I, I would say like this, like, uh, you remember the Miami Heat, if you're a basketball fan, if you're, if you're not a basketball fan, this is going to go right over your head. But the Miami Heat, they, they, won a, they won a championship years ago. They had LeBron, they had Dwayne Wade, they had Chris Bosh, uh, but they also had Ray Allen, who was a sharpshooter in the corner. He didn't do much, but in, when it came, when it, cause he was older, he wasn't the same Ray Allen, but in the last game when they won the championship, the last championship, he was in the quarter locked and loaded, and when they need him, he was ready. Right. And like, we're, we're, we're like that. Like we're, like, we're like Ray Allen in that situation. Like, we didn't know the flood was coming. We didn't know her, a tornado was coming. I didn't know we were going to get, a, you know, have a hundred year storm. We didn't know any of that was going to happen. Uh, and we can just be, be a part of the answer, helping people out because we're ready, because you guys are a generous church. So let's continue to do what God has called us to do, and we're, we'll be able to continue uh, to, to, to meet needs and opportunities. And if you know somebody, we can't help everyone. I know that, right? So sometimes you get paralyzed because you're like, I don't know what to do. Just because you can't help everyone doesn't mean you shouldn't help anyone, right? So we're, we're going we're gonna to help people over the next few weeks. We're going to help. There's, there's people in our church that need help cleaning up houses. Phoenixville and Montclair, it looks, it looks, it looks like a like a disaster happened. And so if you want to, you want to help out, let's, let's be the hand. We always talk about, let's go bring them home. Like sometimes you need, this is, you just, God gives you an opportunity to go be the hands and feet of Christ and you just got to make time for it. Amen. And so we're going to do that. And also next week. So we also have hot dogs today, a little side note for you. Uh, and it's past, it's past nine, nine thirty now. So now it's not weird to eat one. Everybody that came to the first two services, they ate a hot dog. They're weird. Like, <laughs> That's a, that's a party fail, right? It's not breakfast sausage. That's disgusting. And so we have hot dogs out there on the way out. You know, you take a hot dog. And then we're ending our sermon series. Next week, we're going to start something I'm excited for. We're going to start a sermon series to go along with football season called Satan's Bulletin Board Material. And, and, and we're going to have, we're gonna have a, good, a good time. But today, we're ending this, this 10-week sermon series, the longest series I've ever done, done in the history of our church on, on the topic of ton, every story that we've preached, everything we've looked at, it's all been built around the, the, the topic of 10. I'm excited also because today means summer's over and football starts. Amen? Like yes. next week, football starts. We're going to wear our Eagles gear next week, have a special son to be playing Eagles fight music. If you don't like the Eagles, just, you're not invited next week. Like just, <laughs> we are for those that like the Eagles. Like I'm just, I'm just letting you know, like football season starts, I like the Eagles. And if you ask me what, what, who I root for, uh, I like Phoenixville. I like Phoenixville. I like the Eagles. I live in Phoenixville. I've had people have their kids approach me. They're raising money for their, their, their schools. And you know, can you, can you give me money? What school district are you from? If they don't say Phoenixville, I say absolutely not. I don't care. I don't care if your school closes. And so like, I like Phoenixville. I like the Eagles. I don't play fantasy football. I like the Eagles. And so I don't care about anybody else doing good. I'm just like, anybody else like that? That's called loyalty. Some of you need to get it. And so anyway... But we're going into fall, also means we're going into holiday season. 
right? Halloween, and you get to get candy, and Thanksgiving, and Christmas, and New Year's, and I love, I love fall. I started looking at some obsolete holidays. I think we should celebrate some more in, in the fall. Like, did you know November's filled with obsolete holidays? November 5th is National Men Make Dinner Day. Did you know that? Amen. That's not amen. That's an awful holiday. We're not going <laughs> to... I'll clean, listen, I think men should clean dishes, right, all the time. Some of you guys can clean, I just can't, I can't, I can't cook. So I'll clean and we'll go get, we'll go out to dinner, right? And so uh, November 8th is cook something bold day, so get, get, get dangerous. I like this one, November 13th, World Kindness Day. Everybody be kind for one day. That'd be awesome. Followed by uh, November 19th, I love this holiday, have a bad day day. Just get up, make it a bad one, right? You know, look in the mirror, day sucks, right? Like we're gonna have a bad have a bad day. Drive like a jerk. Knock somebody's coffee over at Wawa, right? Do something like that. Like, just have a bad day, right? In the Bible, there's, there's holidays that, that, that the people celebrate, the Jewish people specifically, uh, that were very interesting. Like they, they had a lot of holidays. Like, last week, I, we talked about the story of the Exodus, where the 10 plagues came, 10 plagues came and the last plague was the angel of death, and uh, the angel of death passed over the Jewish people if they had the blood of a lamb on their, their door. Uh, and we, we talked about that. They celebrated that, that, that happening, that occurrence, for thousands of years after that. Every, every year, on the 14th day of the month of Nisan, the Jew, Jewish calendar, they would, they would celebrate the, the, the Passover. They would start on Friday night with killing a, a lamb. They would eat the lamb in a meal. The Passover meal was on a Saturday. Every, every holiday they had, really cool, it pointed to Jesus. They just didn't know it. Like, they, like for instance... When they took the blood of the, of the lamb that they sacrificed, they would, they would reenact what happened in the, in, in the Passover and in, in the Exodus, and they would take a, a brush and they would dip it in the blood of the lamb they sacrificed, and they would put it on their door and check out how they would do it. They would take it from top to bottom, and they would rub down this way with the blood, and they would take it from side to side. Do you see what it makes, those of you who are with me? It makes a cross. They didn't know it at the time because they weren't seeing Jesus in it, but you're going to see something interesting in these holidays. They always point to Jesus. They also, the 16th of every, every month of the month of Nisan every year, they would celebrate the first fruits festival, which Jesus died on a, on a Friday night. He was put in a tomb on a Saturday. And on Sunday, the Bible says the tomb was empty. He was the first fruits of the love of God. He was the best God could give us. And so you see, the Jewish people celebrate the first fruits offering on this day. But here's the problem with those, and there's other ones, and they're not on the 10th. And I said I was going to preach on number 10. So I would have liked to preach on those because it was really low hanging fruit for me. But I had to do a little digging, and I found a holiday that Jewish people celebrate on the 10th called the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement sounds like a horror movie. The Day of Atonement was when the Jewish people would atone for all of the sins of the entire world and the entire country. It was, a, it was a foreshadowing of what Jesus would be to these people, what Jesus would be to us. But thousands of years before Jesus came, the Lord started having, having them reenact this to, to celebrate this day of atonement. And actually, it was less of a celebration and more of a time of evaluation and mourning. This day of atonement. The Bible says in Leviticus chapter, chapter number 16, he, he describes it, he explains it. And here's what he says. He says, then he is to take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting. So let me, let me, let me make sure we paint this picture. There's two goats. How many? Two. Stay with me. If you don't stay with me, this message is not going to make sense to you. I want you to see something really cool though. Day of atonement happened on the 10th of the same month of every year. You're going to take two goats, one one, two. I wish I had them up here so you could see them, but you know that wouldn't go well. I'd be pooping all over my stage. The Bible says in verse number eight, he is to cast lots for the two goats, one for the Lord and the other for the scapegoat. You have two goats. How many? Two. There's one. One's going to be for the Lord and the other is going to be the scapegoat. The other one's going to go free, the Bible says. The priest Aaron shall bring the goat whose lot falls to the Lord. By the way, you don't want to be the Lord's goat in this situation. The one who gets the lot for the Lord, the Bible says that Aaron will bring him and sacrifice it for a sin offering. I don't want to get too gory, but he would slit the throat of the goat and blood would pour out. I don't know how many kids are in here. We have journey kids though. They're probably learning and playing with Play-Doh or something like that. So 
And I don't want to get gory, but it was the quickest way for the pain, most painless way. It was a fast death. He would slit the throat of the, the goat. Now, I'm a pastor, and I've had to do some ridiculous things. But I'm glad this is not in my job requirements anymore. Once a year, you got to get, I don't even like to touch worms. That's why I don't fish. And so the Bible says, Aaron shall bring the goat whose lot falls to the Lord and sacrifice it for a sin offering. But the goat chosen by lot as the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to be used for making atonement by sending it into the wilderness. Which goat do you want to be? You want to be that one. One of the goats is going to be sacrificed and going to represent the atonement for the sins of all the people from all of the land for all of the year. The other goat's going to go free. The Bible says in verse 13 or 15, he's going to slaughter the goat for the sin offering of the people. Take his blood behind the curtain and blood washes us clean. He's going to represent the blood of the coming Christ and he's going to sprinkle it on the atonement cover and in front of it. When he finishes in verse number 20, make an atonement in the most holy place, the tent of meeting in the altar, he shall bring forward the live goat. Picture this. Take his bloody hands and lay it on the live goat's head. Because what can wash us white as snow? Nothing, some of you don't know that song. I'm not going to sing it. The Bible says nothing but the blood. He, he, they're, they're playing out what's to come. Lay his bloody hands on this, this, this scapegoat. Announce the sins of the people of the world. And the blood allows the scapegoat to go free. Some say, well, that's a great story. Glad we don't got to do that anymore. Everything in the Old Testament is a picture of what's to come through Jesus everything. In fact, it says in John chapter 2, watch what it says. It says he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Not just your sins, but the sins of the whole world. He's the one that makes payment for your sins. So I started to think about it because how do you make this a sermon? You know what I did? I went to the story of the last night of Christ's life before he went to the cross. And I found this exact act, the, the day of atonement being played out in the life of Christ. Check it out. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 27, Jesus has been whipped and now he's about to be sentenced to death. In Matthew 27, it says, now it was the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. This is very interesting. How many goats were there? Remember this? One was killed. One was set free. It was the governor's, it was the governor's uh, habit. It was, it was his custom. The Bible says at that time, a well-known prisoner whose name was Jesus Barabbas was there. When the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, which one do you want me to release to you, Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who was called the Messiah? How many people are there? Stay with me. Jesus is on the threshold of his crucifixion. There's two people there. One is going to be released to freedom and one is going to walk the slow death carrying his cross to the place of crucifixion. It's very interesting. The Bible, the Bible says that he asked them, uh, he knew out of self-interest that they just wanted Jesus to, to be killed. So Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat. His wife sent him a message, don't have anything to do with this innocent man, Jesus, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests, the elders, persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. By the way, a little side note, just a few days earlier, these same people were celebrating the coming of Jesus when he arrived in Jerusalem. Don't build your life off the applause of people. Don't get addicted to what people say about you because they can turn on you like this. You know that, some of you. The same people who celebrated him, now because of the persuasion of the religious leaders, what are they saying? Crucify him. Crucify him. They asked the, gov the governor, asked, what should I do with Barabbas? They should set him, set him free. Crucify Jesus and set Barabbas, Barabbas free. How many guys were there? There's two. In the Day of Atonement, there's two goats. One, one goes to death. The other one is set free right here in Jesus' life. One's going to go to death while the other one is set free. I started studying the Day of Atonement. You know what's interesting about the Day of Atonement? The goat that was chosen as the Lord's goat, they would put a scarlet rope around his neck to declare this guy is going to die. After Jesus was whipped, before he went to the cross, right? Before he was chosen to be crucified, you know what he wore? A scarlet robe. There's so many connections to the Day of Atonement and what Jesus does for us in this situation. The Bible says, after the high priest released his scapegoat, he washes his hands. When Pontius Pilate, when he, when he says Barabbas is free and Jesus can, be, can, be, can go to crucify, you know what he does? 
He washes his hands. This old, this old Testament religious festival, the Day of Atonement, is being played out before the very eyes of these people, and they don't even see it. So what does this mean for you and me? Well, make sure you see yourself in this story. See, the problem with, with us in church is we, we, because of our upbringing, like when you watch a movie, are you the hero in the movie or are you the villain? You reenact it. When you reenact Braveheart, I'm a, I'm a hero. If you go out into your backyard and you play a sport, maybe none of you ever did this before, but I used to go out in my backyard, even still do sometimes, right? And I play on my basketball hoop in the, in the back, and I got an imagination, and I put the hoop down seven feet. And so, and, and I'm playing a game. Guess, who, guess whose team is winning? My team. Guess who's the highest scorer? Me. Guess who's the four-time champion? <laughs> Me. Right? Guess who's dunking on people? Me. Guess who's blocking people? Me. Guess who has the best shooting percentage? Me, right? Guess who's the MVP of his imaginary league? It's me, right? Well, if you caught me, what are you doing talking to yourself? I'm winning, right? Like, Lee, we're always the star of the show. So you read the Bible and you're like, man, Barabbas, he got lucky. You read a story like David and Goliath. You're like, I'm David, right? Noah in the ark. You're Noah. You built the ark. You're always, you're always the victim or you're always the star. But I need you to understand something about the story of Barabbas and Jesus. You and me, we're Barabbas. Don't miss it. This is significant to your walk with Christ. This is life changing when you see what Jesus has done for you. Let me work you through this process so you see yourself in Barabbas. Number one, Barabbas is guilty. The Bible says that he was a known criminal, that he had led insurrections and riots through the city, that he was a murderer, that he was a robber. He was a bad dude. He didn't have most of his teeth. He had a mullet. He had to brush his teeth for a long time. He, he, he was a bad dude. You looked at this guy and you knew this guy is a guilty man. His reputation was guilty. His actions made him guilty. He, he deserved what he was getting. He was guilty. And here's so many times in our lives we don't see ourselves like that. You see, oftentimes we think we're better than we are because we compare ourselves to people that are worse than we are. We, we do. Talk to people. You're like, hey, you're, you're bad. I'm not, I'm not worse than Hitler. Like, I didn't do that kind of stuff, which you didn't, right? We compare ourselves to people that are worse than us. We do the, I've been doing this my entire life in sports. I'm better than this person. He can, he's comparable to a cone, but I'm better than him, so I must be good, right? <laughs> right? Like, you, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm better than them. Like, I didn't kill anybody, and I, I didn't, you know what? I messed up this week, and I gossip, but I didn't murder, and I didn't, I, I didn't steal. And, and, and Yeah, I hate people, but I didn't. And we just, we compare. We look at other people. We go, okay, I'm bad, but I'm not that bad. But here's the problem. As a Christian, you're supposed to compare yourself to the perfect Lamb of God. Speak the truth. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and when you compare yourself to the perfect Lamb of God, guess what? You're jacked. You ever... You ever, you ever get in your wife, if you have a wife, she does makeup, she has one of those lights, it's a magnifier. You know what I'm talking about? You ever look in a normal mirror and then look in that mirror? You ever look in a normal mirror where it's not that, not that bright, you're like, I look good. And then you get that and you flip it around and it gets magnified on your, on your nasty nose right in here. You know what I'm saying? Like, I can look right now, I'm like, I don't look that bad, but if they brought that camera all the way in to my nose, and you actually see, who, see what I really look like, as a, you'd be like, dude, you need to wash your face, right? <laughs> like, this is what I'm talking about. Like, you look good until you get close to Jesus, and you begin to realize you're guilty, and some people don't ever get here. Like, especially in churches, it's so weird. Like, we're constantly, like, we're the good guys. We're, we're the good people. We're the saved people. We're on the right side of politics. We have the right beliefs. We're fighting for the right people, which, by the way, Barabbas would have believed too. The Romans were evil. He was just standing up for the little guy, for God's people, his chosen people. But the Bible says this in Romans 2, 3. I love this. I think sometimes you just got to be humbled. The Bible says there is no one righteous, not even one. Hmm. Then he, gets, then he gets good. He says, there's no one who understands. He talks to the smart people. You got an MBA. You got your doctor. You got, there's nobody that understands. There's no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They've all become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. 
I love this because he's talking to church people. You know what the number one problem sin in, church, in the church world is, but we don't ever talk about? Gossip. We, 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 our mouths are filled with diarrhea, right? Even though the Bible says you'll give an account for every careless word you speak, in church, we just let it go, right? The Bible says in verse number 13, their throats are an open grave. He's talking to church people. Their tongues practice deceit. You lied about how much you weighed last night. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways in the way of peace they do not know. There's no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to her those who are under the law, so that, I love this, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. It's not good and bad people on this earth. They're just bad people, he says. Me and you, we're, we're Barabbas. Can we just go down a little bit farther? Sometimes you just got, you got to go down so you can go back up, right? Number two, if you're Barabbas and I'm Barabbas, not only are we guilty, we deserve death. We, we, we deserve death. That's what the Bible teaches. Like if you're, you're Barabbas, he, he deserves death. You, you can just imagine his, his life. He is uh, in jail. And he knows the year, and he, he can hear the crowds of people begin to arrive in Jerusalem because it's the Passover festival. This was the time of the year when, when Jerusalem was the most populated that it was all year. Like People would come from all over the world to celebrate the Passover, Passover festival. So he's in prison, and he knows my time's probably almost up. Here's why he knows that. Because the Romans like to, like to show their strength. So it's very common at festivals like the Passover for them to, to put somebody on a public display for them to show we're stronger than you. We know you're coming in here with lots of people, but you better stay under control and we're going to show you what happens if you don't stay under control. Boom, there's somebody dead hanging on a cross right there. Or a constant reminder. So Barabbas hears the people. He knows my time is always up, is almost up. Like I, I'm, I'm almost to the point where I'm going to die. And he knows that he deserves it. You see, so many times in our lives, we play the game like, oh, we're not that bad. And because of that, we're like, oh, it's, I don't deserve death. But, but the Bible is really clear. The wages of your sin, the wages of your mistakes, the wages of your rebellion, the Bible says is death in hell. In other words, you are much worse than you think you are. You are, you are, you are in a much worse position. You ever have one of those moments where you just don't want to look? Like in college, I was playing basketball, and my tongue used to hang out of my mouth. I don't know why. Uh, probably from years of playing in the backyard, pretending I was Michael Jordan. And so, but I was playing pickup basketball. It was late, late at night, 11 o'clock at night, 10 o'clock at night, something like that. And I had my tongue out, and I was driving in, and somebody hit my, my chin like this up into my tongue. You ever bit, bit the inside of your mouth so hard it tastes like you're eating raw steak? I could feel, like I bit it, I could feel warm flesh and blood. And I, I didn't know, because you can't see your tongue. Like, try it right now. You, can't, you just can't. And I'm like, something's wrong. And I went to my roommate, Jason Lake, and I, and I was like, dude, I think I bit my tongue. He's like, yeah, there's blood coming out of your mouth. And I was like, I think it's bad, but I can't feel it. It's going numb. I was like, it really hurts. I was like, can you tell me how bad it is? And I pulled my tongue out of my mouth. And he just, you ever, he was like, I was like, how bad? And I put it back, pushed it back in, right? Because I couldn't even push it back in. I'm, I'm just kidding. He was like, you can't ignore it. I was like, well, how bad is it? He was like, if you take your tongue out, I literally can see right through your tongue. Yeah, I still got the scar on my, I'll show you. I did it twice. I'm an idiot. And so, <laughs> twice, two times in my life. I got stitches in my tongue. That's a whole nother story. And so I pulled it out. And it was one of those moments where you just... You just had to come to the conclusion, this is, this is going to be, this is hurt, this is bad. This is much worse than I wanted it to be. At some point in your life, that's where a walk with Christ begins. You are much worse than you think you are without him. Your life is much more broken. You are way too bitter. You are a lot more hopeless than you probably give yourself credit for. You've run, but you've never found. You're exhausted. You have anxiety. You have fear. You're overwhelmed, all as a result of how messed up and jacked up both your life has been, your choices, and what's been done to you. It's much worse. And so not only are you guilty, like Barabbas, in this moment, you deserve death. But watch what happens. Number, number three, Barabbas gets substituted. This is the gospel. Watch, watch this. 
So Barabbas and Jesus, how many are there? There's two. I don't know if goats do this. Like the one, two goats walk out. You know, animals, they're smart. They, so they know, like, dude, this is it. And, like, they make eye contact with each other, right? And he's looking back and forth at each other, and they're choosing lots for them. And you're like, dude, I don't want the, the, the biggest lot, and I don't want to draw that. And then you look at each other, and as you're looking at each other, one of them gets led away while the other one, other one stays. So you see this playing out. Barabbas, he deserves death. He comes out, and he's standing there. And he looks over, and this isn't in the Bible, this is just me reading it. He looks over, he sees Jesus. Now, now, Jesus has just been shredded, like shredded. I don't know if you've ever studied the story. We don't, we don't look at it enough. We tend to wait till Easter. We get sad. We forget about it. But he's, he's shredded. He has a crown of thorns on his head. Uh, he has a robe that is covering his shredded back and probably the front of his body. He's been whipped, the Bible says, with a with, with, with a whip that was not just one whip, but filled with many ends and had pieces of glass and rock in it. And so when you would whip, they would yank it like this. And literally, it's believed that he was literally on the brink of death. When he breathed, you could see the insides of him. When you ever watched The Passion of the Christ, but you, you, they, they, they showed it where he, his face, is, he could barely see. It's, it, he's almost unrecognizable. And here he is. He's, he's, in, he's cuffed and Barabbas is cuffed. Jesus is innocent. We know because scripture says he was. It wasn't just that the Bible says he was innocent, but actually the rulers, Pilate says, this, this guy's innocent. He's done nothing. He, he's only here because these people are jealous of him. And then Barabbas, mullet, half his teeth, robbed, murdered. Nobody likes Barabbas. His face is on posters. Nobody's friends with Barabbas. His family's not proud of him. He's not significant. He's going to hang on a cross and be a common criminal. And the Bible says uh, that, that Jesus, Jesus is about to take his punishment. So you can just imagine he's looking at Jesus. Jesus is looking back at him. He's looking at Jesus. He begins to hear the crowd say, say release me and crucify him. And his, his, his jaw is like, what's going on? And Jesus looks at him. And I, I, it's not in the Bible, but but. My understanding of who Jesus was, I, I bet maybe he even said, I got you. I got this. Now, I don't know if he said that, but I do know on the cross, he said a bunch of things at the end of his life, one of which he said, it is finished, which at that time was a common phrase they wrote at the end of a receipt that was paid in full. So it wasn't just saying stuff. He was saying, like, you know how you go to the store and you get yourself a debt like that? And after you pay it, they give you a receipt that says paid in full. All of the sin, all of your mistakes, all of your sorrow, all of your baggage. When I went to the cross, I paid it in full. It's finished. And you can just see it. He walks away. They load the cross on him. I, I, I get teary out just thinking about it. They load the cross on his back. And he carries, he carries the cross to the place where he dies as the crowd follows and, and he's being released from his shackles and he just watches. He just watches as, as this man, who the Bible says, he, he doesn't have his life taken from him. He lays it down. He laid it down for us. And he substituted. And, and the coolest part of it, the part that I think is the coolest is he, he goes free. He's, he, he's new. He's made new in this moment. In fact, the, the name Barabbas, if you study it in Aramaic, which that's the language of Jesus, the name Barabbas means son of the father. Isn't that interesting? I'm going to go to the cross and I'm going to die the death that you should have died so that you can be adopted into the family of God. And he leaves. And I don't know how his story ends. I wish I did. I wish it was like Barabbas got saved and you know, he went to the cross, and he watched the cross, and he, and, he, and he was part of the first church. We don't know. So there's really only two options. First option is what I've seen so many people do. They, they see Jesus. They know he's the substitutionary atonement, which is a big church word to mean that he stepped in as your substitute and made atonement for your sins. They, they, they hear that message. They, 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 it changes them for a moment. They get free from their sin, right? Maybe Barabbas, he got free. He went free. And for a few short weeks, he was like a different guy. Like he, he went to the cross, he watched Jesus die, he, he went to a couple remember, like services where they remembered Jesus with some candles there, and like, I'm making all this up, but like, and he, for just a few weeks, he was, 
he was like a, a, a straight guy, like a straight edge razor guy, like he was on fire for the Lord, like, like he was doing what he was supposed to do, like, and then he found some success. Maybe he started to get a big head. Maybe he wrote a book, signed, signed it, I don't know. Maybe he got a girlfriend. Like nothing ruins like success, right? I've seen this in church. You start at the bottom, Jesus brings you out of the pit, you forget where you were, and maybe, sadly, Barab Barabbas walks away because we never hear about him again, right? And some of you say, he would never do that, to which I would say, I see people do that all the time. It's one of the saddest parts of my job. But I, listen, this week was too bad to go there. So let's, let's just pretend the other part happened. Like, Jesus changed him, and, and he followed Jesus to the cross, and, and, and then Jesus was put in the tomb, and maybe, maybe he didn't know what to think, and he was confused because he was like, I'm released, and this guy died for me. And maybe, maybe he carried the weight of that shame around because this person died for me in my place. Man, I feel like crap. But then maybe he heard he's back from the dead. I don't know where he's at. And maybe, maybe, maybe he was one of those 500 people, the Bible says, saw him alive. Maybe even better, when Jesus said to wait in the upper room because I'm going to fill you with the Spirit, the same power that enabled me to raise from the dead is going to be in you. Maybe he was one of those 120. Maybe God filled him with the Spirit of God and he began to go everywhere and tell everyone about Jesus. Hey, I got to tell you about my story. I was supposed to be put on a cross, but Jesus stepped in and he was my atonement. He sacrificed his life for me. And if he can save me, he can save you too. And, and, Maybe that's the story. And I love that part because I see that all the time. See, some of you in this place, you're like, why, 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 why church? Why, why, why are you here? Why are we sing? Why religion? Well, we're not re religious at all. I just want you to, I want you to understand this. Re religion is what killed Jesus. Religion is a list of do's and don'ts. You do this, you do this, you don't do this, you act here, you don't do that. And then eventually, maybe, maybe if you've done enough, God will take you back. When you die, you don't know. Relationship with Jesus is different. Relationship with Jesus says you are a complete mess. You are dead in your sins. You're not good enough to get back to him. There's nothing you can do to go back and cover your mistakes. But there's a God that sent his one and only son that died on the cross for your sins, both past, present, and future. And through, you, through him, you have security. Through him, you have a future. Through them, you have forgiveness. You have mercy. You have hope. You have grace. You have life. And he can save anyone. He can save a Barabbas. A few, few days later, he changes a Paul. And he's been changing people from that day forward. People that shouldn't be used by God. The Bible says the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. That's my Jesus. And he's here right now. But you got to see yourself in the right light. You're not the star. I, I, I know it's hard to hear. You've heard you're a snowflake. You've heard you can be whatever you want. You've heard if you believe it, you can achieve it. And all this other Saturday special stuff that I grew up hearing. Listen, you're not good enough. You can search and never find, but Jesus is. You're much worse than you think you are, but Jesus is much better than you think he is. Amen? Amen. Let's stand to our feet all over our houses. Do me a favor. Would you just bow your heads for a moment? I wonder who you'll be today. I wonder who you'll be today. Listen, the only reason that we have church, there's two reasons. Number one, we want to come in here and we want to give the highest praise to our God that we can. Period. In the midst of really difficult weeks, somehow as a follower of Christ, we're still able to lift our hands because we serve the one who's in control. And some of you had really bad weeks. Some of you had a really bad year. Some of you had, had a bad life. And you're here right now. And we're here, number one, we lift up the name of Christ. And here's why we lift up the name of Jesus, because he has the ability to draw people to himself. And when he draws people to himself, he changes people forever. It's not my words. It's not our work. It's not our effort. It's not our performance. It's not our buildings. It's not our hot dogs. Thank God. It's Jesus. The name above all names. The name by which all people may be saved. The name of Jesus. The gospel is simple. Everyone has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Everyone. Everyone. The wages of sin is death and hell. Every one of us deserves death and hell. That's what we deserve. 
But the Bible says, the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. For anyone who calls on his name shall be saved. What do you do? You confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord. And in that moment, he'll come into your life and he'll begin to do a work that you didn't even know could be done. He'll change you. He'll equip you. He'll empower you. He'll embolden you. He'll release you from things that have held you captive. He'll heal you where you've been hurt. It's only Jesus. And listen, everybody comes to this point in their life where they realize, man, he's real. He's real. And I believe what that person in the front, that pastor, the word of God, whatever it is, wherever you hear about Jesus, I believe that Jesus says and can do what he says he can, says he can do. Like, I, I believe that and I want that. That's what happens. That's what happened to me. That's what happened, has happened to thousands of people over the last decade at Journey Church. I'm here. I know I don't want to live life the way I'm living it anymore. I'm tired and I'm weary. And I believe Jesus is real. I don't understand everything that's going on. And I don't know where I'm going to go from here. But I know today I need Jesus Christ. So I guess that's, that's my question. Is this your day? Is this the moment with every head bowed and every eye closed? And you would say, you're, you're speaking to me. You're speaking to me. Maybe you've been in church for a long time. Maybe this is the first Sunday you've ever been here. Maybe you're in Montgomeryville and somebody invited you. Maybe you had a really bad week, man. Something happened that you, you were not prepared for. And literally, you feel like you're limping into church right now. You're overwhelmed by life. Some of you in this place, you have found all that life can give you, all the success that life can give you, and yet you're still not content. That's because you need Jesus. There's nothing on this side of eternity that can fulfill you besides Jesus. So I'm going to ask you a question. When I ask you this question, if your answer is yes to the question, I want you to, without thinking about it, without worrying about the person to your right or left, without being afraid, in the most boldest way possible, if your answer is yes, when I ask you this question, I just want you in faith and in courage, shoot your hand straight towards the sky and say, hey, you're talking to me. I'm ready. I'm ready. Here's the question. Are you tired? Are you overwhelmed? Do you wake up every day hoping for it to be different? And yet it's always the same. Are you ready to receive Christ as your Lord and your Savior? If you're ready to receive Christ all over this house, would you just put your hand straight towards heaven and just say, that's me, this hand, there's a hand, there's a hand, yeah. Yeah, there's a hand, yeah. Yes, 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 yeah right here in this moment. I'm just going to receive Christ. Thank you, guys. If you're in Montgomeryville, you just keep your hand held high. They're going to let me know. Would you just begin to pray? Maybe you're not a praying person. You're like, I don't know what praying is. Listen, the Bible has, has a verse I love. It says, it says, Jesus is like a friend that sticks closer than a brother. You know how it is when you just talk to somebody that you've known for years? And you just talk. And it's like, it's just, no matter if you haven't seen them for years, when you, find, when you see them, you just talk. That's prayer. Let's get rid of all this religious garbage that we do. This facade of these big words that we say that we don't even understand. The Bible says that he, if you humble yourself, he'll lift you up. And so prayer is just simply you. I, Jesus, I need you. I can't live one more day on my own. I've been doing this on my own for years and I'm exhausted. And it's the posture of your heart, not the perfection of your prayer that invites Jesus into your life. Let's begin to pray. Lord, we love you. And Lord, we thank you for this day. And we thank you for those that are gathered here in Montgomeryville that, man, are just giving you their life right now. Like in this moment, Lord, the, the story of Barabbas, we see ourselves there. And Jesus, we want a relationship with you. And the Bible says if we would call on you, if we would call on you that you would come into our life, that you would begin to heal us, make us whole, forgive us, set us free, fill us with grace. Most importantly, give us your love. It's not a love that we earn, so it's not a love that we can lose. Thank you for the relationship that's being birthed with you today. Lord, where it's not over, this is just the beginning. You're going to begin to speak to us and walk with us and encourage us and convict us and strengthen us and do things in our lives that are unmistakably you. Not only are you going to work in our lives, but you're going to begin to work through our lives. Lord, other people are going to see what you've done. And Lord, we're going to brag on you, the goodness of you, the kindness of you, the grace of you. 
Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for all that you've done. We love you. But as we, we leave, let us never forget what you did for us on the cross. Let us, let us live our life in the gratefulness, the attitude of gratefulness with eyes fixed on the foot of the cross. Thank you, Lord, for, for saving us. Thank you for dying for us. Thank you for giving your life up for us. Thank you for being a substitute for us. And Lord, our best way to thank you is to live for you, to be your church, to love this world the way you want us to love, to serve, to be your hands and feet. And so, Lord, we leave this place with the correct mindset. Lord, we're, we're available and we're here at this time in history to reach this world. Jesus, continue. Lord, bring a revival in this day and age. A revival. In Jesus' name we pray. One more time, Journey. Let's shout amen together. Let's clap together one more time. Hey, before you leave the stream today, we have some important things that we want you to know. First, you are the reason that we stream our services, so please take a second and fill out that online info card so we can get you connected with everything happening here at Journey Church. You can find the link in our description or find it on our app. If you have any questions, send us a message or visit us at jrny.church. If you're watching us online but you don't live near us, that's okay, but we would love to get you connected to a church in your area. The Bible tells us to gather together to encourage one another and to reach those far from Christ. So, send us a message and we can get you connected to a church near you. Have a great rest of your week and we will see you soon. Can't keep it down, time's running out, here we go. Come with me now, stand up and shout, let them all know. We're gonna let them all know. Not anymore, I'm keeping score, here we go. Stop on the door, let them all know, we're gonna let them all know, we got the, we got the power, we got the